Hello everyone, today we discuss obstructed labor, um, a common cause of uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. Uh, we know obstructed labor um, accounts for about 85,000 uh, maternal deaths every year. Uh, it's one of the top five uh, causes of uh, maternal mortality. Uh, one study showed that um, around 26% of maternal deaths are a result of um, obstructed labor. Uh, but uh, these uh, patients who are dying from obstructed labor are actually hidden uh, in statistics. Um, most patients who die from obstructed labor will be recorded as sepsis, they'll be recorded as um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, when the actual cause of the maternal death, the underlying cause, was actually obstructed labor. Um, so the objectives of our discussion today are to understand what obstructed labor is and how different it is from uh, a prolonged second stage or a kephal or pelvic disproportion because it's only when we have these uh, clear uh, differences in our minds that we'll know how to uh, manage uh, these patients. So as usual, let's deal with uh, terminology. So obstructed labor is um, really um, a neglected labor. That's what I call it. So it is a labor in which there's a mechanical obstruction that has been neglected, and this has led to fetal and maternal uh, compromise. That's my definition of um, obstructed labor. I've seen lots of people interchange obstructed labor and cephalopelvic disproportion. What you are saying in cephalopelvic disproportion is that you have a head that is um, absolutely bigger than the pelvic inlet or outlet, or you are saying that uh, you have a head that is um, relatively bigger than the um, pelvis. So what that means is that um, sometimes the head is small, but it's not positioned properly. So you have a brow presentation, you have a face presentation, and so on. So that is a cephalopelvic disproportion because um, the head in the weights positions will not uh, go through the maternal pelvis. That's all you are saying. Nothing uh, beyond that has happened. So once that uh, cephalopelvic disproportion is neglected, then becomes what is called an obstructed labor. And ideally, we should not have obstructed labor in our facilities, especially in the urban setups, because how has that labor been neglected? Has the patient been delivering at home? Has um, the patient been waiting for a cesarean section for four hours, five hours on the labor ward? That is what really an obstructed labor is. Then lastly, we talk about a prolonged second stage. When we talk about a prolonged second, second stage, we really are talking about numbers. And uh, this is uh, numbers relating to the normal. So if a labor lasts more than, um, a second stage of labor lasts more than two hours in a prime gravida, then we say that is a prolonged second stage. When a second stage lasts more than one hour in a multigravida, then we say that is a a prolonged second stage. The confusion here is that um, a lot of obstructed labors are second uh, stage diagnosis. So uh, some people might confuse just a prolonged second stage and an obstructed labor. You might have a prolonged second stage, but there's no obstructed labor. And um, sometimes you have an obstructed labor without without um, a second stage. But uh, having said that, um, it should be important to realize that a lot of diagnoses of um, obstructed labor are second stage of um, labor uh, diagnosis. So how does um, obstructed labor present? So normally it presents um, with a woman that has been um, laboring for a while, definitely above 18 hours. So she's been in labor, and we know that uh, labor, the normal duration of labor is somewhere in between 12 
and 18 hours. So this woman has been laboring uh, for more than 18 hours. And in our setup, many of them above 24 hours. They've been on a boat. They've been trying to go through the mountains. They've been trying to cross rivers. Um, they've been on the lake, um, trying to get to the nearest facility. And therefore, uh, the first cardinal thing about us diagnosing uh, obstructed labor is recognizing the duration. How long has this woman in, uh, been in labor? And like we've said uh, previously, this is really uh, a second stage uh, diagnosis. So that's the first thing. So when we examine the um, patient, usually she'll be exhausted, um, she'll be um, tachycardic, uh, she'll be dehydrated. Um, when you do uh, your pelvic exam, the vulva will be swollen, uh, the vagina will be dry, it will be hot. There will be no lycra there uh, because during the time that labor has been going on, all the lycra has been drained out. Uh, when you do an abdominal exam, you find there's a bundles ring, which is a retraction ring. Because the uterus has been contracting for a long time, the upper part of the uterus, um, the muscles have become shortened and it's become thick. So you can see this depression on the mother's um, abdomen as a result of this um, retraction that has happened uh, in the upper uh, part of the uterus. Um, when you look at the urine, uh, the urine will be blood stained. Um, when you look at um, other parameters, there will be ketones in the urine because this woman hasn't eaten for a long time and her urine has ketones. Um, all the glycogen in the liver has been um, depleted during this uh, long duration of labor. She's probably not eaten. So that uh, urine will have ketones as a sign of, um, of this hunger. Uh, that is um, that is going on. When you look at the fetus, um, there is always fetal distress when you are um, making this diagnosis of obstructed labor, and many times fetal death. Um, if the presentation is cephalic, there will be carpal, there will be molding, there will be a high station, and those things that are showing that this labor is mechanically uh, not possible. Um, then one final point, and that final point is that the way uh, obstructed labor goes uh, for multiparous women is very different from the way labor goes in um, uh, prime gravidas. So when the uterus starts contracting in um, multiparous and they are in established labor, when there's an obstruction, um, the, the uterus keeps contracting to bypass the obstruction. So the contraction gets stronger and stronger and stronger. She gets a bundles ring, as we have described, and she eventually gets a, a ruptured uterus. In a case of a prime gravida, when there's an obstruction, uh, usually um, the contractions get stronger and stronger, and once the uterus realizes that there's an obstruction, it just stops contracting. So prime gravitas usually end up with a, um, uh, with a fistula when there's obstructed labor. And multigravitas would normally end up with, um, with a ruptured uterus because the uterus does not stop to contract when there's an obstruction. The contractions just get stronger and stronger because the, the multiparous uterus is thinking that I've done this before many times and it keeps contracting and contracting. Uh, a prime gravitas uterus... Um, because of all this acidosis, all these um, ketones in the blood, it just um, stops contracting like any other muscle after, after it's exhausted. So that's really the difference. So prime gravidas end up uh, with fistula many times with uh, ruptured uterus being very rare in prime gravidas. But in multiparous, these contractions uh, continue and they end up with, um, uh, with a ruptured uterus. So how do we manage these patients with um, obstructed labor? So the first thing that we need to do is just make sure we check the airway, make sure that they are breathing, make sure that their circulation is intact because we know these patients have been laboring for a long time. They are dehydrated, they are ketotic, they are acidotic. And we check the vital signs because with obstructed labor, there's a 
there's a risk, a big risk of uterine rupture. So we have to check the blood pressure, we have to check the pulse, we have to check the respiratory rate and um, see that this uh, mother is okay. We have to take blood for full blood count. They might have a more concentration, they might have anemia if they've been bleeding. Uh, we check UNDs, we check LFTs. We have to give IV fluids, uh, normal cell line, ringers, um, lactate. Um, this would be uh, something we would do. We would also might need to give some dextrose to this patient to help them gain some energy because of this um, uh, length of time they've been in labor. Their uh, uterus due to contractions for a long time has been exp ex ex expending uh, some energy. We have to catheterize the patient and normally what we find is that there's scanty urine and that urine is uh, blood stained. You know the head is pressing on the um, uh, on the urethra and uh, that is preventing urine from coming out because the the head is stuck so we need to catheterize sometimes we need to push the head up in order to be able to catheterize the the patient uh, we have to put the patient on antibiotics uh, because there's a high risk of um, sepsis uh, as a result of the prolonged labor the cervix has been open for a long time. A lot of vaginal exams has, has been done or have been done throughout the time that the patient has been in this prolonged labor. So antibiotics are important. Uh, whether the patient is going for the cesarean section, whether they are going to deliver somehow vaginally, uh, we have to give antibiotics. We have to talk to the mother about the diagnosis respectively, um, cancer about the status of a baby, and many times the baby is dead in obstructed labor. There's uh, fetal distress, and usually these babies will come out uh, with a very low um, APGA score. Then um, we have to explain all those to the mother. Then we have to uh, assess this mother and um, decide how we are going to uh, to deliver her. Are we going to deliver her using forceps? And this uh, decision, if it's going to be made, it should be at a very uh, senior level because really in an obstructed labor, you don't want to use forceps. They are being mentioned here only to be discouraged. You don't want to use a vacuum really and forceps in somebody who's had um, an obstructed labor, especially in multigravidas because the contractions in multigravidas increase as the labor is being obstructed. So the contractions have tried to the maximum to get this baby out. So if it's not coming out, there's really a problem. We have to try another another method. There's need um, to consider um, a destructive procedure. Again, a cesarean section has a very high morbidity and mortality in our setup. Worse in a situation where you have had uh, an obstructed labor. So uh, trying to do a craniotomy or any other kind of destructive procedure, if it um, prevents cesarean section, that's really something to consider. Uh, the um, destructive procedures are not very popular uh, nowadays, but uh, where we are working from, it's very important to consider it. Otherwise, we have a mother and the baby were dead uh, on the table or after delivery. So the best way to handle an obstructed labor really is um, ideally uh, get a patient uh, for cesarean section. This is especially important if the baby is alive, of course, that we optimize um, the condition uh, of the baby as well. So cesarean section is the way to go, but we need to think about these other possibilities when the actual patient is in front of us we individualize uh, the management of um, of the particular patient in front of us so when we're doing cesarean sections for these patients uh, we need to make sure an experienced person is going to do this cesarean section because it might be difficult we might need to push up the um, head uh, before we start a cesarean section and sometimes the head is pushed up uh, during a c-section to make it easy to uh, extract this um, stuck head. The other thing that we need to uh, think about when doing this uh, cesarean section is that the cut on the uterus, uh, the hysterotomy, the cut on the uterus should be a little bit higher than usual because um, the bladder has been really pulled up uh, most of the lower segment is um, 
it's kind of um, gone in this um, obstruction. So we need to cut the incision higher uh, to avoid uh, damage uh, to the bladder. The other thing we have to consider is um, maybe packing the abdomen uh, because once the liquor goes in the abdominal cavity, it will be foul smelling um, because this patient has been in labor for a long time and there's risk for infection. Uh, so packing uh, might be helpful and also maybe washing the abdomen after um, a surgery uh, with uh, normal saline might be something uh, to consider in these uh, particular uh, cases. Uh, we have to think about uh, prophylaxis for fistula and if somebody has had obstructed labor, they need to get a catheter. That catheter stays in um, for 14 days to drain the urine. We know that with obstructed labor, there are micro infarcts uh, in the bladder. And if the urine um, is kept in the bladder, uh, accumulating those micro infarcts, uh, the tissues will slough off and the urine will start coming from, from the defect. So putting in a catheter for about two weeks um, makes the urine drain uh, through the catheter and makes those micro infarcts heal and prevents uh, a patient from having obstructed, um, from having a fistula. The, um, that's that's really what we have to do about these patients. And they should be on antibiotics because sepsis is a very, very common um, complication of uh, obstructed labor. Then um, there are those patients who we make a diagnosis of uh, fistula right on the words. We know that usually we make a diagnosis of fistula uh, about a week after an obstructed labor. If we didn't put a catheter in, and um, then we realize that the woman comes back leaking, then we make a diagnosis. But if we make that diagnosis of fistula before uh, the woman uh, goes home, then we have to put in a catheter. So we put in a catheter as well. The urine is leaking, of course. We can keep that catheter up to six, six weeks, eight weeks. If the fistula is um, reducing, if the amount of urine coming out is reducing and the catheter is able to be maintained in the bladder, we can keep that catheter for, for six to eight weeks. And uh, we'll see that some women end up um, with a fistula closing uh, with on catheter treatment. If that, if that uh, fistula is not closed at the two months point, the urine is still leaking, um, we would usually just um, uh, remove that catheter and um, get this woman to a fistula surgeon. Usually there are phone numbers from Fistula Foundation and we have to get this woman to uh, connect uh, with, um, with them and then get um, this woman to to treatment. So um, that is what we have to do. And um, lastly, uh, we have to talk about um, a prevention of um, obstructed labor. Uh, really, um, we have to prevent obstructed labor because we see it causes a lot of morbidity and mortality. We have to prevent it by uh, preparing women in the antenatal period about the dangers of obstructed labor. Um, we have to prevent it by um, good quality antenatal care uh, and also uh, monitoring women um, using a pathograph and not letting labor go on and on and on in the presence of um, a healthcare worker. Um, of course, nutrition is important uh, for young women preventing uh, pregnancies uh, early in childhood. And nutrition makes uh, a child's um, pelvis develop better and delivery is um, easier with a well-developed um, uh, maternal pelvis. Of course, other things are beyond the health system, roads, um, rivers, all those geographical barriers, um, beliefs uh, in the community about obstructed labor, where the community believes that um, obstructed labor is a result of um, um, a partner being unfaithful. So 
all those things have to be worked on for us to be able to prevent obstructed labor in our um, in our communities thank you so much for listening and we will talk um, next time